Tonight's scripture reading will be from Matthew 26, 53 through 56. Again, that's Matthew 26, 53 through 56. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber, with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all that was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. There's a song in the psalm book that I really enjoy, I really like to sing, I really like to lead. If you want to look at it, it's page 170. We're, we're going to project it in a couple in a couple of moments, but if you want to look into it, it's, it's on 170. And uh, it, this one is just close to my heart. It, it is not my favorite one because of just the beautiful harmonies. It's not because of the way it sounds. But the words in this song, they're very powerful. And they're very powerful to listen to and to hear and to sing. This song of 10,000 angels, it contains some great thoughts. And it can help us focus our hearts and our minds on what our life should really be, pa- be based upon. Before we get into the song, we're going to really dissect this song and really pick it apart and, and, and go verse by verse, basically, on the life of Jesus. But I want to tell you on how this song came about. So it's actually pretty interesting. It's pretty amazing how this song was written. If you look at it, it says that Ray Overholt uh, is, is the writer of this song. And then Ray was born in 1924, so he was probably in the same first grade class as David Farr. Uh, uh, <laughs> he was born in, uh, in Gaines, Michigan. His mother, Claire, was a singer uh, and played the piano and encouraged her son to do so as a young boy. By the time he was 11, his dad bought him a guitar, and he began to sing, and Ray was inspired by uh, Gene Autry's music. I had to look up who that was, uh, so please don't, don't uh, I mean, I just did not know who that was, but uh, now I know. But by the time he was 10, uh, he knew how to play the keyboard which is pretty amazing for a 10-year-old. If you ever watch America's Got Talent, uh, I love that show. I watch it uh, every Tuesday night if, if I can. And there's some amazing talent on there of young kids performing and just seeing someone playing a piano at 10 is just pretty amazing. But he didn't also know how to play the piano. He also knew how to play the harmonica. That's even cooler to me. Uh, He grew up in a farm in Michigan and would perform in town halls and at meetings just here and there. Later on in his life, he would be in a group called the Grand River Boys and would sing on radio stations. He left that, and then he hosted a TV program called Ray's Roundup. Uh, where he entertained such guests as Gene Autry, whom he was inspired by, Hank Williams, I do know who that is, so, yeah, and Stuart Amblin, uh, and many more. And after leaving this show, Overholt's uh, life took a turn. Uh, It took a turn that was on a road that was on the destruction. Um, He went into the nightclub business. Uh, and during this time, he was drinking heavily, uh, heavily, and just drinking uh, constantly, smoking constantly, cussing, just doing whatever he wants. It, it was the nightclub life. Um, live it up, basically, is how he was doing it. He was a musician, and he would perform at these nightclubs on a nightly basis. One day in 1958, he decided to change his life for the better. He thought that there was better life than the nightclub life. So he's written secular songs before his whole life. He's done that. He, but he wanted to write a song about Christ one day. Isn't that just amazing? He just, he just all of a sudden wanted just to start writing a song about Christ and something from the Bible. And so he opened up his Bible. Don't know how he did it, but he opened up his Bible, which he knew very, very little about. And he began to read a portion of Scripture that describes Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane telling Peter to put away his sword. He read, he read where Jesus told Peter that he could ask his father, he could send 12 legions of angels. Now, Ray uh, Overholt, 
He did not know at the time that that would mean more than 72,000 angels. So he thought a good song title for something that he would write would be called He Could Have Called 10,000 Angels. Before he wrote this song, he didn't know much about the life of Christ. And so what he began to do, he began to study. And as he read more about Jesus, the more he admired him for what he has done for him. It's pretty interesting where this first line of that song was written. And it's in Battle Creek, Michigan at a nightclub. He wrote the first verse of the song in 10,000 Angels at a nightclub. Someone came up to him, another musician that was, he was working with, and uh, he was like, man, what are you doing right now? What, what, what are you writing right here? What are you writing about this Jesus Christ for? And then Ray began to explain that he was writing a song about Jesus. And, the, and that man said, you might as well just stop. That song, it's not going to go anywhere. And look where it is now. This song has become one of the favorites of Christians all over the world. What we're going to do is we're going to examine the song. And we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about the life of Jesus. We're going to go back 2,000 years ago and, and discuss the events that led up to the cross and how it has impacted your life and, and see what Jesus went through. You probably already know what Jesus went through. But I think it's even better to study more about it. It's late at night. And after spending hours with his disciples, Jesus goes off alone in prayer. He looks at Peter, James, and John and says, You know, you need to stay awake and keep a lookout while I pray. Then Jesus goes further into the garden, falls on his knees, and he agonizes in prayer. He's incredibly stressed to the point where he is sweating as it great drops of blood. You might see me sweating great drops of blood. No, I'm just kidding. But he is just sweating so much where it is just great drops of blood, as it says in Luke 2, 22 and 44. He gets back up and finds his disciples sleeping. He wakes them up, and it's not much later, a large group of soldiers led by his own disciple, his own follower, Judas, and they come and arrest him. Go to John chapter 18. In John chapter 18 and verse 12, we read, it says, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officer of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Jesus, this innocent man, was arrested and chained as a common criminal and led away for trial. The soldiers, they shoved Jesus through the city on the way to the high priest's home. People hear the noise and they began to look out their window and see Jesus, he is in chains. The man who had just days earlier been greeted with cries of Hosanna. And as he rode down the street in Jerusalem as king, now right here, he's being led down the street. Early in the morning, as a prisoner. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15 and verse 12. In verse 12, And Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted out to all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered them to be crucified. We're going to sing the verse, verse of this song.
Jesus, he's been dragged from one mock trial to another. The Sanhedrin condemned him to death and spat upon him. Herod rejects him because Jesus wouldn't speak against the accusers. Pilate showed himself as spineless and washed his hands of the whole situation, saying, this isn't my problem. Then Jesus, he scourged. If you don't know what that means, it is brutal, a torture. Uh, it is being whipped across the back until the muscle and bones in the back are clearly visible. And then he's turned over to the soldiers for them to do whatever they want before they kill him. They can literally treat him as a rag doll, treat him as a toy, as, what is, as whatever they want to do with him. Go to Matthew chapter 27. Let's read Matthew's account on, on, on this right here. Matthew 27 and verse 26, it says, Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the, uh, into the, into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered around the whole battalion before him. And if you really don't know what that whole battalion means, it means more than 600 soldiers. It's not just 10. It's not just five soldiers. There are 600 soldiers doing whatever they can do to Jesus. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. See, they put a robe on his bleeding back. They twisted up thorn vines and they would put them on his head. They mocked Jesus, the one who was Christ, the one who is from heaven in fake worship. They took the reed and they just started hitting him on the head, driving those thorns, those vine thorns that were that it deeper and deeper into his head. And during this whole time, there was no one defending him. He was by himself. You can put it back on the screen. Upon his precious head, the is now beaten and bloody his face it's unrecognizable from all the blood that is running down from his head and what they do next they nail his hands and his feet to the cross think about this Jesus he's hurt he's exhausted he's dehydrated he's sleep de deprived he is mentally spent even though he's feeling all of this, he's still determined. He's still thinking clearly. He is still thinking about what needs to be done. 
Has there ever been a time in your life where you're just hurt, where you're just tired, where you're just exhausted from, from everything in life? You, you might even be dehydrated and mentally spent. Maybe you've said, you know, I'm just tired of serving the Lord. I'm tired of just coming to church. I'm tired of doing all this. You know, that's the wrong attitude to have. Christ went through so much pain that you can ever imagine just for your sake. You know, there, there should not be any excuses from anyone, including myself. Jesus is raised up on the cross now to begin his final torture before dying. He looks at the crowd that's gathered. This is one of the hardest verses in the song to me. And through the blood that runs into his eyes, he sees the soldiers, he sees people gather there, but he sees his mother. And his mother sees Jesus on the cross. And Jesus sees his mother. No mother wouldn't want that to happen to their son. No mother would want that to happen to anyone. See, Jesus was literally alone when he died. His mother wasn't for this at all. But as he's on the cross, struggling for every breath, he made sure that his mother was taken care of. Go to John chapter 19. In John chapter 19. Starting in verse 25. But by standing by the cross of Jesus where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he, stand, whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Behold, woman, behold your son. And then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour... The disciple took her to his own home. Everything had been taken care of. It was almost over. And the last request. He knew that his mother was taken care of. And the last request of Jesus on this earth was a drink. Let's keep reading in 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. See, the wicked work of killing Jesus is finally completed. The Jews accomplished their goal. Let's, let's sing the next verse. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. sinful work of man was done but this was also the plan of God it was God's grand plan to bring about redemption to man 
Jesus didn't fight the mob. Jesus didn't resist the authorities that falsely arrested, accused, and condemned him. He refused to drink the drink that would help to deaden the pain. He took on full force of his death. He was taking on the full punishment of sins, and nothing was held back. The entire world's sins were on his shoulder, and while he was on the cross, he had no helper. No one to help shoulder the burden. It was all on him. And then he died. And his death made salvation possible for all men. You see, Jesus, when you, when you, read, when you sing this verse, Jesus died alone so that you wouldn't have to be alone. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone, and when he cried it's finished, he gave himself to die. You could turn it off right there. He could have avoided it all. But he died alone for you and me. That's the part that gets me in the song. He died alone for you and me. And I need to thank God every day for this. And you need to be thanking God every day for this. God loved us so much that he gave us his only son so that we do not have to face punishment. Can you turn it back on? He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone. Maybe you haven't obeyed the gospel and put on Christ in baptism. You could change that tonight. We're, we can help with you. We can study with you. Salvation, as you can see, it's made at the cross. Maybe you haven't been washing the, but maybe you've already been washing the blood of the Lamb and you've been restored, and that has changed your life. But you have sin in your life. If you have sin in your life, brothers and sisters, you cannot make it to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want you to go to heaven. And if you need God's forgiveness, we want to help you. We'll pray with you. The church will be with you. You need just forgive. If you just need encouragement, we are here to help you in anything. We want you to know that you're loved. Jesus died for you, and I hope that you realize what He went for you for what He went through for your sake. Come to Him for salvation. Come to Him for rest. If you need anything, please come as we stand and as we sing.